Uh, for those of you who are new to the group or don't know me, my name is Dr. Jason Banta. I'm the Extension Beef Cattle Specialist stationed at Overton, and this would be part of our Ag in the Evening series. And the topic for tonight is drought, getting the most out of your operation. And when we planned this topic uh, back in the fall, we weren't exactly sure where we would be from a drought standpoint. And really, it depends a little bit on exactly where you're located. So some of this may uh, fit you perfectly right now. Uh, part of it may fit you as we move to the future. So we'll, we'll talk about some different things to keep in mind. So with tonight's topic, there's a lot of different directions uh, we could go with it. I'm going to try to talk about some things that hopefully are going to be relevant to a lot of people as far as some things that may have happened and how you can use that to your benefit moving forward. And then some things you may want to consider moving forward or various things. If you do, what are some pros and cons and some things to be aware of? So the first time thing is anytime we're thinking about drought, whether we're in a drought or whether we're coming out of a drought, it's always important to me to think about preserving some things. So we want to preserve condition. And we're really talking about condition on those cows because body condition on cows is so important from a reproductive standpoint, but also from a nutritional standpoint of getting through the winter. So if we look at this winter, it's been pretty mild, especially uh, today is extremely mild. Uh, so, some places got up close to 80 or even a little above 80. But if we look at, you know, the weather right before Christmas, a lot of us were down into the teens or, or, or colder. And so making sure we have those cows in good body condition makes it much easier for them to handle that cold weather. We want to preserve our forage resources. And so we think about the health of those forage stands. We want to make sure we manage those during as well as the after a drought to maximize productivity out of them. And then we want to think about preserving and building the equity in our operations. So just kind of as a recap uh, where we're at, if we look at the most recently released drought map, which would have been released on uh, July 5th, um, you kind of see where we are. Uh, most people know by now, you're probably tired of looking at these, but they're still in, important from a management standpoint. White means conditions are normal. Yellow is abnormally dry. And then as we get into the tans and darker reds, the darker that color is going to be, the more severe the drought is. So if we look at most of East and Southeast Texas, it's pretty good. As we get into Central Texas, it kind of depends on exactly where you're at. Part of uh, South Central Texas down here is still pretty rough. Uh, part of the Central Texas area, when we kind of look at McLennan, uh, Hill County, uh, some of those counties still a little drier over there. I'll just tell you, personally speaking, uh, family operation over in McLennan County. We hadn't seen any rain for six weeks. And if the forecast hold, it looks like we're going to go a 60-day window here without any rain, unfortunately. Um, when we look into Oklahoma and Kansas, they're still pretty dry. Nebraska is still pretty dry. California is still pretty dry, although they have gotten some rain the last couple of weeks that are helping that drought a little bit and should show up a little bit more on the drought map that gets released uh, this coming Thursday. But if we look at the entire Western United States, uh, there's still large portions um, that are, are not in the, in the best shape. And that's something to keep in mind as we move forward with some other things. Speaking of moving forward, as we look at the projections, and so this would be the latest projection released on December 31st, and it would be for January 1 through March 31 of 2023. Again, white is normal. The green means there was some drought, but likely that drought's gonna go away. Gray means there is drought, but hopefully it's gonna improve. Uh, brown is not a desirable color. That means drought's there and drought continues. So I guess the good news if, the map is right for most of East and Central Texas. It looks like we may be okay for the next three months, but as we move a little further West, unfortunately that drought persists. 
And as we get into South Texas and far West Texas, um, while they may not be in as much of a drought, it looks like the drought may get worse uh, in those areas. And then all the central United States still looks pretty rough moving forward. Some of the Western United States looks like it may improve there and even maybe on the edges, some of the drought may completely go away. So hopefully, as far as those areas where the drought's projected to go away, hopefully those forecasts are accurate. While it may seem a little odd for us in Texas to be thinking about the rest of the country, it's important to think about the rest of the country because of the impacts that has on cow numbers, as well as the impacts that gonna, is gonna have on demand for uh, forage resources and how much hay is produced nationally. If we look at the uh, temperature and precipitation outlooks for the next 12 months, um, again, a white normal, blue is chances for uh, cooler than normal temperatures, and then the uh, light orange towards the dark orange is above average temperatures. Uh, so unfortunately, in each one of these maps is for a three month window. So this first one here is February, March, April, March, April, May, uh, April, May, June, et cetera. But if we look at this throughout the next 12 months, unfortunately, it looks like temperatures are gonna be warmer than normal. So even if we get average precipitation, it's gonna be important to realize that participation precipitation isn't gonna go as far because those temperatures are gonna be warmer. And also we know when we have warmer temperatures that decreases our forage quality. We look at precipitation chances. Uh, green is the chances are for above average rainfall, tan and brown below average rainfall. And again, three months at a time. So if we look at um, February, March, April, that really matches what we saw on the drought map just a couple of slides ago. March, April, May is looking a little bit better, continuing to, to, to get better. So we're looking at maybe average rainfall for most of the uh, rest of the year after we get about March in Texas and even the Western United States. And so hopefully that forecast is accurate moving forward and we'll start seeing a little bit more precipitation here. So kind of go through that to lay the groundwork for some things. And so um, hope some of you are definitely in non-drought conditions right now and hopefully it stays that way. But we have to think about how do we manage or forage resources moving forward because they've been stressed, stressed over the last 12 to 18 months. And so what are some things we can do there to help those forages recover and make sure we have those stands as robust and strong as possible moving forward? So one of the biggest things we can have an impact on is gonna be grazing pressure and stocking rates. Uh, and so making sure we're not overgrazing those pastures. And so that's gonna be one of the temptations we're gonna to have to avoid with drought culling, a lot of producers have gotten down to what's really probably a more appropriate long-term stocking rate for them as a tendency amongst cow-calf producers in general is to overstock. So if you have decreased back down, you may wanna look at that and really think, is this the level I should stay at moving forward before you start increasing those numbers uh, moving forward? Uh, because increasing those numbers, more cattle doesn't equal more profit. A lot of times uh, being a little more conservative in those stocking rates can actually increase net income overall. So when we think about grazing pressure and stocking grade and what that means for forage production, um, is this is actually a picture I took August 4th of 2011. I, I showed this picture in the following two quite a bit because they just demonstrate the concept of grazing pressure so well. So if we think about back to that 2011 drought, this would be right in the middle of it. While this pasture doesn't look great, when we think about those conditions, not too bad. There's a little bit of grass out there and even they managed to produce some hay in that field in the background of the picture. 
In contrast, if we look at this pasture, there's really no reason a cow should even be in that pasture. Uh, you can see those pictures were taken on the same day. Uh, even more importantly, the first picture was on the north side of the highway. The second picture was on the south side of the highway. So in reality, those two pieces of property likely got the exact same amount of rain. So why does one of them look like a dirt field and one of them have some forage? It's all about management, making sure we have those stocking rates correct and making sure we're mindful of any kind of fertilization management. Uh, as well as weed control. The biggest component of that, though, is going to be stocking rate. And so we have to think about that. And we also have to think about that in context of where fertilizer prices are right now. So this is a question that's come up quite a bit over the last year, and it's going to be a question that continues to come up moving forward. Is it a good plan to decrease or eliminate fertilizer? And, and really thinking about nitrogen fertilizer here. And my first response to that is going to be, how many cows are you going to keep? Because if you're going to decrease nitrogen fertilizer, you're automatically going to have to decrease cows. Otherwise, you're going to be overstocked. So if you routinely apply fertilizer and you stop that and you don't reduce cows, you're overstocked regardless of whether rain falls below average or average. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with decreasing some fertilizer. I'll tell you that's a strategy we actually use in our family operation, but I decrease cow numbers to go along with that. And so as we're moving forward, if you're going to look at kind of with nitrogen fertilizer where it is, and it looks like it's probably going to be at the, those levels, it has come down some but it still looks like it's going to be higher than what we were used to the last three to five years. Um, if it's going to stay that way, we have to keep that in mind in relation to cow numbers. Uh, and when we think about fertilizer and especially nitrogen fertilizer, while it will have an impact on quality, the biggest impact is going to be on forage production. And we need that forage production to run those cows. So Keep that in mind there. Another thing we really need to think about is rebuilding those hay supplies. Some of you are fortunate and have been stocked a little lighter, and so you still have pretty good hay supplies. A lot of people ran out of hay uh, coming out of last winter, and there's a good chance a lot of people may run out of hay coming out of this winter as well. Uh, so we want to think about what can we do to make sure we get enough hay produced this coming spring and summer, and how do we get a little extra hay produced if we have a place to store it uh, for future times of challenging conditions. So um, that's going to be something that's really going to help us moving forward, because as you know, if you had to go out and buy hay this year, that hay was very expensive and, and really was tough uh, from a budgetary standpoint to look at doing that. Um, make sure we improve that forage quantity. We've already talked about that some, as well as that quality to reduce supplementation needs. So we talked about fertilizer prices being a little on the higher side compared to historic prices. Uh, feed prices are on the higher side compared to historic prices, and it looks like they're going to stay that away uh, for sure through 2023. Uh, we'll have to see what happens in 2024. But what we can do to help offset um, that expense is if we'll do a better job from a forage quantity standpoint, so those cattle can be more selective and think about forage quality when we're producing that hay that can really reduce our supplementation needs. And so that can definitely save us some money there. If you're interested on in kind of reviewing some of that, uh, there's some previous recordings uh, where we spent some time talking about uh, forage uh, quality and the factors that affect it. Uh, and so I would encourage you to go back and uh, look at those videos, or if you have any specific questions, feel free feel free to reach out to Dr. Uh, Olson or I, either one, or feel free to go ahead and ask those at the end of tonight's session. 
So one of the things people may be thinking about right now is if you're fortunate enough to be in one of those areas that's kind of out of the drought is should you buy some more cows? And people are thinking back to what happened after 2011 and 12, where we really kind of got into 2013, but really 14 and 15, where we saw those higher calf prices. Is it a good idea to buy some more cows to try to take advantage of that? And it may be as long as you don't overstock and as long as you don't overpay for those cows, because it could be very easy to spend more buying a few extra cows than what those uh, higher prices in the future may uh, be able to pay you returns back. The other thing to remember is you remember back there, those prices were pretty short lived as far as those higher prices. So keep that in mind. So if you do think you wanna buy some more cows and the answer to that question is yes, then when do we do it and which ones do we buy, all right? And the win is kind of a challenging one uh, as far as getting that timing right. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit more in the coming slides. And we'll definitely spend some time talking about what are some options of some females to potentially buy. So I just wanted to kind of review some of the favorable things moving forward, some of the things that may not be quite as favorable as we, we start thinking about those decisions moving forward. So decreases in cattle numbers. Uh, we haven't got the USDA beef cow inventory for January 1 of 2023 yet, but that should be coming shortly. But everything points to we're going to call even more cattle than what most of the early projections were. And I'll, I'll show you if we end up with a 3% uh, call where that'll put us here in just a second. Um, as corn prices continue to be on the higher side, that typically means reduced carcass weights to some extent, uh, which is a favorable thing. And as we mentioned already, is for a lot of people, drought does appear to be improving. Uh, but unfortunately, for a lot of the Western United States uh, and for a lot of Texas, still challenging from that standpoint. Some of the things that aren't quite as favorable and some of the things that are going to be a negative from a calf price standpoint are from a cow-calf profit standpoint is obviously feed prices. As feed prices remain high, it costs cow-calf producers more to supplement cows, but it also puts negative pressure on calf prices uh, because cost of gain is more and so feedlots aren't as willing to pay as much for those calves moving forward. Um, fertilizer prices, we've already talked about that, uh, and that's gonna be an ongoing deal, uh, especially as the uh, war in Ukraine with Russia continues just because of the global impact from a fertilizer standpoint, as far as fertilizer coming out of Russia, um, inflation considerations, everybody's well aware of that. Uh, there are growing concessions about a uh, recession. Typically, recessions put negative pressure on beef sales. So that's something to think about. The value of the do U.S. dollar and the impact it can have on exports. Uh, from that standpoint, uh, we have seen the value of dollar uh, drop quite a bit. It's still up, but it, it's not up in that 112, 113, 114 range. Uh, like it, it was, it's come down off of that quite a bit. Uh, so when we think about calf prices, uh, I think everybody's in agreement that we're likely headed for higher calf prices at some point. It's hard to say exactly when that's going to be due to all of those conditions we've talked about. We are starting to see some of those already, and I think we'll continue to see those moving forward. But these feed prices are going to limit that to some extent. And this overall economy may limit that to some extent. So kind of give you an idea of, of where we've been and where we may be going. So I just took going back to 2000 and plotted and how many beef cows do we have in the US? And so these bars are in million head. And so you can see where we've been you can see those lows we saw back in 13 and 14, and that would have corresponded to those high calf prices. 
we saw in 14 and 15. Then one thing to keep in mind is if we look here, we rebuilt the beef cow herd much quicker than I think most people thought. I'll tell you, we built rebuilt it quicker than I thought coming out of those 11 and 12 droughts. So we peaked again kind of in 18 and 19, and we've been on a downtrend. You can see where we were last year, where we were still well above those lows we saw back in 13 and 14. Um, and then I put a projection in here for 2023. So if we assume a 3% year over year decline, you can see that kind of puts us back on par where we were at that low, which this decline is a little bigger than I think most of us would have thought uh, earlier in the year. But at the pace we've been, I, I think there's a good chance we'll be pretty close to that. Um, so, so we've really sold a lot of cows and slaughtered a lot of cows the past 12 months here and a lot of heifers as well. The red bars would be beef production. So you can see how that's changed. Uh, and that would be in billions of pounds. Uh, one thing to keep in mind is even though we have had less cows, Cattle are bigger than they used to be. So each one of them is incre incrementally heavier. And so it's that kind of changes that shift between number of cows and, and beef production. So we, we do have to keep that in mind. How much should you be willing to pay for those cattle moving forward? And what are some of the things that are going to impact that? Well, obviously, how do you feel about the market outlook and how strong do you think it's going to be? What are your annual operating costs? And that's going to be a, a big one there. Uh, where you at from a cash flow standpoint? And uh, some people really like to use net present value analysis, and there's some online tools. That's not something I get real hung up on, but for those who are interested in, there are some tools to calculate that if you want to use that to estimate what you may wanna pay for some females moving forward. When we looked at restocking options, there's a lot of different choices out there for those of you who are interested in kind of reading some more on that. I'll kind of highlight some things, but we won't get into major detail is on our beef.tamu.edu website. There's a publication by Ron Gill, Stan Beavers and Bill Pinchett or they have a publication on evaluating replacement female alternatives. Uh, and they actually list kind of 15 different groups of females that if you were looking at purchasing, that may be available and then kind of talk through some of the pros and cons of those various groups. So when we think about those groups, what are some of those factors that should be considered for each group? So if you're thinking about buying some before you go buy cattle, you really need to think about what is it going to cost you to run that cow? What's that projected calf worth? How soon are we going to get that projected calf? And then what is my profit and how many of those calves are, are we going to get at those higher prices? And I will tell you, it can be very easy to overpay for females right now uh, based on what you could get back out of them in the future. Uh, so being a little more conservative is probably um, the safer bet, at least in my mind. Um, so some of those things that need to be considered is what females are available, uh, what's the quality of those females. So as conditions improve, everybody's trying to hold on to the better cattle. Now, the one thing that some people may be able to take advantage of is if you are in a much better shape from a forage standpoint and, and you feel confident, uh, unfortunately, there are producers out there still struggling. So there may be some opportunities to still pick up some quality cattle at some lower prices. Uh, but that's something you have to think about. What's your initial investment? Uh, so are you buying open heifers? Or are you buying three in one pairs? And, and what would each one of those cost you? Is there going to be a developmental phase? I mean, like if you're buying heifers, growing those heifers out, breeding them, having them go through a gestation, then having a calf, and then before you can sell that calf, 
versus are you buying a mature cow that's already bred um, and so she's ready to go? What's the rebreeding potential of those females? Uh, so if you're buying thin females, it's important to realize they're not going to breed back uh, at normal rates. So you're going to have less calves the next go round. So you have to think about that from a pricing standpoint. Market flexibility, if it turns off and you feel pretty good, and then all this about your weather conditions and unexpectedly it gets dry, what kind of flexibility do you have to market those animals? Can you find the genetic potential you're looking for or that matches your current herd? What's the potential longevity of those females you're buying? And it may make sense to buy some cattle that won't be around as long because you can buy them for less money and go ahead and take advantage of some short-term market conditions. What kind of dystocia or death loss potential would you have with various groups? Uh, what size calf are they going to wean? What would their nutritional requirements be now and moving forward? What kind of coal rates are you going to have? And a big one to think about is biosecurity concerns. You don't want to be bringing a problem that's going to cause major issues for the rest of your herd. Uh, this is just a chart from that publication. I won't go through it in detail. Uh, but kind of listing for those different groups of females where they would kind of fall for each one of those categories we just went through. Um, are they going to be uh, low, moderate, or high uh, from an availability standpoint, from a nutritional requirement standpoint, those kind of things? I'm going to talk about just a few things with, for each group just to kind of get you thinking about some of those things and then that paper is there as an additional resource. Uh, so with heifers, the nice thing is there's a large selection of heifers out there, especially when we're thinking about open heifers uh, that you could buy if they are truly open heifers and, and never been exposed to a bull. That's nice uh, from a disease risk standpoint because those heifers are going to be lower risk. The other thing about buying open heifers is obviously then you can breed them to the bull of your choice and, and kind of get what you're looking for there. Uh, moving forward, there's probably going to be a pretty large selection of bred heifers as well. Uh, we're already seeing prices go up on those uh, quite a bit, so that's something to keep in mind. The other thing on the open heifers is um, there's going to be some demand for those to go in the feedlot. So it's not just the demand for those for replacement heifers, but demand for those going into the feedlot. A big thing to really think about on the heifers, uh, especially open heifers, but even bred heifers, is how long it's going to be before you have a calf to sell and how many calves could you sell on a higher market before we see that market start to decline again. We look at two-year-old females. These are some females that everybody likes to buy when they're trying to increase their herd size. As a result, they're going to be some of the most expensive options out there. Uh, the other thing is when we think from a weaning weight standpoint, they're going to wean a lighter calf than let's say if you bought a four to eight year old cow. Uh, also from a rebreeding potential, they're tend, uh, gonna tend to have the lowest rebreeding potential out there. Uh, one of the things, if you're looking at buying two year olds, especially if they're about to calve or have calves on side, is try to buy some that would be ahead of your calving season. So it gives them a little more time after calving to start cycling. So they're ready to breed, to breed right at the front of your calving season. The thing you really want to avoid for all females is something that would be right at the tail end of your calving season. You're just creating a problem for yourself moving forward. And we really want to use the drought, whether it's just changing up the herd you have right now through some continued culling and those things to, to really fit a certain window or especially if you're buying females moving forward to really work towards your benefit and not spread out your calving season or be right at the tail end of your calving season. 
So keep those things in mind. Really think about ahead versus behind or at the end of your calving season. Uh, these two-year-olds, like I said, they're going to wean some of the lighter calves. We're going to see lower rebreeding rates, and we're going to see higher nutritional requirements for them. When we look at three to six-year-old cows, um, we're talking about something that's a little further along, uh, but still early in their life. So we still have pretty good longevity out of them, uh, but not quite as high nutritional demands as what those two years, two-year-old females are and tend to have better rebreeding rates, especially for the four to six-year-olds. The three-year-olds, it's really gonna depend on how they've been taken care of and managed. Sometimes they have better breed up than two-year-olds. Sometimes they have worse breed up than two-year-olds. So uh, kind of keep that in mind. But again, another age class that there's gonna be a lot of demand for moving forward. Uh, so we tend to see a little higher price there for those females. When we think about these seven and older females, obviously you don't want anybody's calls, but if you're buying some cattle out of an area that's still experiencing some drought, we could find some quality cattle that just may be on the thinner side that's in this age group. Obviously you don't have as much longevity, but likely you're buying a proven productive female in this situation and you're gonna be buying one that should be giving you a good size calf right away. Uh, obviously, a lot of times you can buy them at a discount compared to some younger females, but still get good production out of them Why? hopefully we're in this window of higher prices. So if you can find some of these older cows that are quality cattle that may just be a little thin or somebody's having to unload them, because they may have not been as fortunate from a rainfall standpoint, there could potentially be some really good value in some of these older females. Uh, when we look at really thin stalker cattle, uh, obviously there's a lot of risk involved with these, and this is something you really wanna make sure you manage different than your current uh, cow-calf herd or operation. We, we need to keep them separate. Uh, but a much lower uh, initial investment, but probably something you're not looking to keep for the long term, maybe just something you're looking at to try to take advantage of some market factors in the short term here. Um, when we think about sourcing cattle, okay, sorry, I couldn't remember where I, I moved the slide to. So when we think about sourcing cattle, obviously some things we need to keep in mind is I mentioned availability. Some groups are gonna be in pretty short supply and so they're gonna de demand a lot of money. Availability, obviously the, the ideal place to be is buy cattle right before it starts raining. Because once it starts raining, we all know what those prices are gonna do. Those prices have already started to in increase. Uh, but the, the thing you don't want to do is, is buy them and then it not rain for another 60 or 90 days or, or, or several months. So it, it's all about your risk tolerance and how comfortable you feel about future weather predictions and, and where you are right now. Health is a big one we have to keep in mind, and, and we'll talk about that a little bit more moving forward. Uh, where should you look at purchasing those females? So uh, special replacement females are an option. Um, Jordan Cattle Company out at San Saba, they tend to have a special replacement female sale every month. If you're interested just to kind of see what's happening with the market and what's available and what's out there and what they're bringing, is they do uh, show that on the internet. Uh, and so you can set at your house and, and watch that sale. Uh, they'll typically on one of those monthly sales sell three to four thousand uh, females, so you can really see a, a lot of what's going on there. And the video is really good, so so you can really see some quality differences in those cattle. Uh, Johnson Cattle Marketing is one over uh, in East Texas uh, where they have some special replacement female sales a couple times a year. Your local auction market, depending on uh, what you're what you're looking for there, some of those will have some special 
replacement female cells, and then there definitely can be some other options out there as far as special cells. Uh, private treaty is one a lot of people uh, look at, and some people prefer uh, that avenue versus an auction type setting. Uh, if that is something you prefer, uh, there's some internet websites. One of them that sees a lot of cattle uh, bought and sold on is a website called The Cattle Range. So that's one you can check out. It may be just word of mouth where you know somebody uh, who's selling some females that may fit. And then there are still some newspaper publications out there that run some classified ads uh, that you uh, may could find some that you're interested in. If you're looking at your regular weekly auction, it's really important to keep in mind why those cattle are there. And there's a big difference whether it's just somebody selling one or two, uh, and there may be some good ones that they just need to pay some bills and selling, or there may be a reason they're selling uh, versus somebody who has a herd dispersal. Uh, typically, those herd dispersals are something you want to more look at because it's less likely uh, that somebody's culling something that you just may, may not be able to see when you're looking at them. There are people who trade a lot of cattle. Um, nothing necessarily wrong with that, but you do need to be aware of that and what you may be getting into. Uh, with any of those things, if something doesn't feel right, uh, that's probably just to move on and don't get yourself in a situation you're going to regret later on. Um, should you look at buying short to mid-gestation females versus long-bred uh, heifers or females? Some things to consider there from a disease standpoint. Uh, BVD and trick are probably the two big ones. Uh, so with trick, those long bred heifers or long bred cows are going to tend to be a lower risk from a trick standpoint than what a short or medium bred female would be. If you do buy some of those short and medium bred females, uh, just make sure um, you keep those away from your bull uh, and that they calve out. The last thing you want to do is buy some. Um, there be a trick problem in those females, they abort. You have your bull in there. He breeds those cows after they abort and come back into heat. He gets infected and transmits that to the rest of your herd. Now, the long bred cattle doesn't fully eliminate the risk, but it greatly, greatly reduces the risk. Uh, the other thing from a BVD standpoint, so that's a viral disease, and what we have to be mindful of there is what we call a BVD PI, or persistently infected calf. And so females at a certain point of gestation, typically we're talking about early to mid gestation there, if they get exposed to an animal that has a BVD infection, and then they get what we call an acute infection, that calf's immune system may be at a point where it doesn't recognize that virus as bad. It just, it doesn't see it as a bad thing. And so that calf won't, that calf in the uterus won't fight it off. And so when it's born, it's constantly shedding that virus, causing everything else to get sick. So uh, we'll talk about later on, but if, we buy some females when they calve, we may want to test those uh, calves for that BVD. Um, those that are sharp to mid-bred are going to be at a higher risk for that than the long-bred females would be. When we think about exposed or not exposed back uh, from a trick standpoint, definitely want to look at buying females that are not exposed back. If they're exposed back, we definitely need to handle those differently. Uh, don't put your best bulls in with them and don't put mix them in with your cows uh, till we get a calf out of them, get them, get them bred back and get a calf out of them. Uh, so, so keep those things in mind. Uh, some other things to keep in mind is which females should you select. And so if you look at some of these special female cells, they may have females of different uh, lengths bred from the same producer. 
And so which ones do you want to buy? Which ones do you want to avoid? So if they're all from the same age and the same herd and they've been managed the same, this situation, buy those that are eight months bred or six months bred. Those short bred or open females are going to be subfertile females and ones you want to stay away from. So keep those kind of things in mind if you are purchasing some females. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about those short-term cows and how there may be an option there um, as far as a little lower cost there, but obviously you may not get the quality or the genetics you're looking for and definitely need to be aware of those uh, from a disease standpoint and how you manage those compared to cattle that maybe you may have purchased private treaty or something like that. So if we think about country cattle that you bought directly out of the country versus you bought out of an auction market, those cattle would tend to have lower risk, but they're not foolproof. The other thing you need to be aware of, are they truly country cattle where this producer has had these cattle uh, for a long time? Or is it a situation where they went and bought some cattle and put them together and now they're selling them? totally different disease risk profiles in those two groups. Uh, when you can purchase animals from well-managed herds, obviously you're probably gonna have to pay a little bit more for those. Uh, so if you're buying some other ones, we just need to make sure we keep them separate. With all of them, we need to be aware of uh, quarantining. And that's not something we always think about. But especially as we think about how many cattle have moved around the country uh, the last 12 to 18 months and will be moving around the country the next six months, that's something that, that's probably worth the effort of doing. Uh, I mentioned BBD PI testing earlier. So if you do buy some of those uh, pregnant females, when they calf, we can take an ear notch from that calf and send it to the lab and just confirm none of those calves are PIs. And what we really want to make sure we avoid is having those PIs in the group when we're getting ready to breed those cows back because it can really cause some reduced reproductive rates. Um, I'll just tell you personally, um, we bought uh, a group of replacement females here earlier this year. They're calving right now. I uh, actually sent some ear notches off uh, this morning, just to confirm that. Uh, looking at less, depending on where you send them, the lab we sent them to were less than $4 a calf, just a pretty good insurance policy uh, in my mind there. And one thing you may consider is if possible, manage some of those new purchases as a separate herd or unit till you can make sure everything's okay. From a quarantine standpoint, how long do you need to quarantine them? And this is where things get a little more complicated and there's not necessarily an easy answer. For stocker cattle, or in this case, if we were thinking about open replacement heifers, 30 days tends to be good in most situations. When we think about cows, and especially when we're thinking about reproductive diseases until they're pregnancy tested are, are really until we get a live calf on the ground, which, which may be a pretty good while. Um, if they're pregnancy tested and you don't have bulls out, you know, you could quarantine those cows for 30 days and then mix them in with your cows. Just don't put your bulls in with those cows till you get a calf on the ground in those situations. And if you do manage them as a separate herd uh, and you see some problems or suspect there may be some problems, uh, make sure you test those bulls before you kick them out with a different group of cows just so you don't spread a problem from one group to another group. Um, so those are some considerations of, of buying some cows if you do need to buy some more. As I mentioned earlier, more is not always better. If you have culled down to what's probably a more appropriate level, don't just go out and buy more cows just because that's what everybody else is doing right now. The other thing is hopefully you've taken advantage of tightening up calving seasons if you did need to cull some cattle. Uh, so just kind of wanted to quickly recap on some of the benefits of a set calving season. Um, 
drought culling is a great time to transition to a fixed calving season or, or tighten up a fixed calving season of uh, whatever situation you may be in. Uh, one of the real nice things about a fixed calving season is it reduces labor required from a calving standpoint, from a processing standpoint. It gives you some flexibility from a marketing standpoint and less trip to sell those calves. And also we want a, a fixed calving season so we can avoid those summer, summer barn calves. They just don't perform as well. And with hot temperatures, we do increase the risk of losing some of those calves. Uh, we can do a much better job and save some money from a nutritional and feeding standpoint with fixed calving season versus calving 365 days a year. We have more marketing opportunities because it makes it easier to wean calves. We can look at special calf sales. Uh, if we have extra forage retaining the ownership of those calves through the stocker phase, um, we could look at going to stocker and feeder calf sales, um, even if it wasn't a special calf sale, or it may let you get into a situation where you have enough to sell in truckload lots, and there's a huge advantage to that. Uh, if you are looking at this opportunity to kind of convert from year-round cabin season to a con controlled cabin season, there's a lot of different ways to do it. One of the easier ways to do it is just start with a spring and a fall season, and you can either continue that or over time, discontinue one of those herds but the nice thing is if you do a 90 day spring and a 90 day fall you don't have any cows that are going a long stretch before they're getting bred and falling into one of those groups so that's kind of what i wanted to cover tonight give you some things to think about moving forward uh, if you do need to buy some figure out the, the right timing for you and those kind of things. So any questions anybody has, whether it's about what we covered tonight or anything else, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat box or go ahead and unmute and ask those. All right, well, with that, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up tonight and everybody have a good evening and hopefully you get some rain. And if you've been getting some, hopefully it'll go ahead and continue for you.